Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker of The Week, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Our special guest this week is the Senior Fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution, also a staff writer at The Atlantic, Jonathan Rauch. Now, I want to explain to our listeners that I have had a little bit of a home catastrophe this week. And since I now work from a home office, it affects all of us, namely that there was a sewage backup in the basement. And uh, yes, it is every bit the nightmare that you can imagine those words convey. And at the moment, there is going to be an uh, irreducible amount of banging and noise emanating (laughs) from this house. I will try to be very quick with the mute button, but if there's any unaccustomed sound, it's unavoidable, and I apologize in advance. All right. Uh, We have a tremendous amount of analysis to do regarding the elections this week that were very dramatic. But before we do that, I would love to just start with a slightly more philosophical take because Jonathan is with us. And it just so happens that The Bulwark ran a review of his book, The Constitution of Knowledge, and it was appreciative. It praised your book, Jonathan, but it also said that it was going to quibble. It was from Laura K. Field. You you make this very eloquent defense of the scientific method and the way that we determine what's true and what's not in our modern society, but she believes that you're a little bit too narrow in what you consider to be uh, good faith members of the constitution of knowledge community. She says you rule out creationists, Christian scientists, homeopaths, astrologists, flat earthers, anti-vaxxers, birthers, 9-11 truthers, postmodern professors, political partisans, QAnon followers, and adherents of any number of other belief systems and religions. I think she really in particular did not like the mention of postmodern professors. So what have you to say in your defense? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> First, thank you for letting me join you today. It's always a privilege to be with you on, on this show. And I loved Laura's review because it's the kind of review every author hopes for, deeply thoughtful, critical, and constructive raise, ways of raising deep issues. I understood her to be saying that I am too harsh and judgmental about saying the rules of the constitution knowledge of knowledge are exclusive. And, and I take a, a strong view on this, I confess. I argue that like the U.S. Constitution, which sets the rules we use to, to do our political governance, constitution of knowledge sets some pretty strict rules about how you govern the world of, of truth, objective knowledge. And in doing that, it makes a very broad claim, I say, which is that it has the same claim the U.S. Constitution does, exclusivity. If you want to make a law, you've got to go to Congress, pass through a bunch of gates. If you want to make knowledge, you've got to go through an elaborate process. And I argue that a lot of people don't want to do that. They want to go straight from Revelation or the Bible or their social group or tribe directly to knowledge. And I cut that off. And I think I'm right to do so. Laura's more of the field that says, well, you know, that's going to feed arrogance. And that, in fact, is what's got science in trouble. She accuses me of tipping into the kind of raw, raw science and that this feeds into liberal hubris. And I guess I'm taking that as a friendly amendment because I agree with her. I try not to be too raw, raw, but I am in my book, The Constitution of Knowledge, deliberately saying that we epistemic liberals, the people who really do believe in uh, validating what we believe through some you know, very extensive and very demanding social, social systems, that we've been too diffident in both understanding and defending that system, that we need to be more aggressive, assertive, confident. It is the only system, the only system that consistently advance human knowledge, put the vaccine in our arms that's protecting us right now. So yeah, I'm pretty, pretty aggressive about making the case for it. And I understand that may make some people uncomfortable. And if they want to dial it back a bit, 
while maintaining the basic premise, I'm okay with that. I'd be curious if Bill has thoughts, given his deep thoughts on liberalism and its exclusivity and its excesses. And of course, by liberalism, he means 19th century liberalism, oh, yeah. not progressivism. What about it, Bill? Well, <laughs> this would be a long story. Let me make two points, one of which something that my teacher taught me a long time ago, namely that neither faith nor revelation can refute the other. And there's nothing other than a scientific act of faith that can tell us that revelation is unequivocally false. And there's a long tradition of argument about this. And so to some extent, cutting off faith as a source of knowledge is an arbitrary move. But you know, let me descend from these ethereal heights but to something uh, suggested not only by Laura's review, but by the title that Jonathan chose to give his book, The Constitution of Knowledge. Now, if the Constitution were nothing more than a set of black letter rules, not open to interpretation, then we would be in more or less the zone that Jonathan just traced in, in his answer. But if we take the implied metaphor seriously, or the simile, or whatever the heck it is, then I think Jonathan would have to conjure with the fact that, like the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of Knowledge is subject to a certain amount of interpretation of its rules, which can be narrower or broader depending on the particular interpretive tradition you choose to follow or move you choose to make. As the son of a scientist, I know firsthand that what counts as good science is not a cookie cutter template. So I don't know how Jonathan would react to that, but just off the top of my head, those are my two comments. Hmm. Uh, let me just interject also as the child of a scientist that some of the biggest debates of the 20th century among scientists involved things that other scientists thought were physical impossibilities, like quantum theory, right? Yes. All of, I have no disagreement with, with anything that's been said. I should mention for our audience, who's not been deep in these weeds before, that, that when I'm talking about what I call liberal science or the constitution of knowledge, I'm not just talking about chemistry and physics. I'm talking about the whole modern enterprise of knowledge making, which spans everything from the hard sciences to the humanities, but also journalism. The law is included. That's a fact-finding enterprise. And a lot of what government does, the Congressional Budget Office, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, it's all of that stuff. It's the whole knowledge-based, reality-based system. Mm -hmm. Of course, it disagrees with itself all the time about what the rules are and who's applying them right and wrong. We've all at Brookings been part of those debates. You know, hey, Bill, your latest paper, you got the methodology wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's, of course, a feature, not a bug, right. because other systems set those things by decree or never grapple with them at all. And that's part of my answer to Laura Field is, you know, it might turn out by some weird coincidence that homeopathy was right all along and that science missed it. Well, that could happen, but my beef is not with homeopathy per se. It's with the unwillingness of homeopaths to go through all the steps you have to go through in order to be able to say in a textbook, for example, or in a medical school classroom, this is true. It's about the process. If you wouldn't mind my summarizing it, if homeopathy is discovered to be true, it will be through double-blind studies and experimentation and careful analysis of data, not through anecdotes or assertions by people that it worked for them, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's really interesting. Not nearly as interesting or stimulating as your book. And I highly recommend it to people, The Constitution of Knowledge. It, it sort of pulls together so many things that we take for granted, but that are actually precious parts of our inheritance and not as well understood as they should be. So thanks so much for writing it. And now let us turn to another area of life that requires data. And that is the results from the 2021 elections. It was a bit more 
surprising, I would say, a bit more one-sided than one would have expected. I'm going to start with you, Linda. Were you expecting New Jersey to almost unseat the Democratic governor, which went for Joe Biden a year ago by 16 points? And now Governor Murphy is just eking out a victory. Barely hanging on by a thread. No, absolutely not. I was not expecting New Jersey at all. And in fact, uh, because I'm traveling and I often keep on cable news in the background when I'm puttering around in my kitchen in my condo in Colorado, I happen to have seen a story, I think it was the day before the election, about New Jersey. And it was basically making fun of the Republican candidate because he at one time proposed that swearing ought to be outlawed. And then it had what would that, that do to the other bulwark podcasts? Oh right, my God. right. You know, so <laughs> right. So that it, it you know, but for making fun of him, he's not a serious guy. I mean, how could you even consider electing some guy who thinks you can't say swear words in public? So I thought, gee, that looks very interesting in retrospect uh, after the Mm -hmm. election results were in. I think what it points out, and it sort of does circle back to some of the discussion we were just having, there is, I think, this huge cultural divide in America. And there are a whole lot of Americans who feel uh, themselves looked down on. They look at some of what I think Jonathan is absolutely right you know, in his description of why we have to be rigorous in our thinking about science, why we have to have ideas that are subject to evidence, and you need to be able to show that the efficacy of one method over another, and it has to be done in trial and error with double blinds and all of those things. All of that I agree with. But there are people who feel like scientists, particularly now in the COVID era, professors, politicians, the the news media, they treat some of these things as theology. And rather than being liberal, that they're illiberal in the way in which um, ideas are um, simply dismissed. And I think there was a kind of backlash to that. I think this election reflected the backlash of people who are sort of tired at being laughed at, sneered at, looked down upon. And they, I think, were the base of what gave Trump his ability to rise. During the 2020 election, I think particularly among suburban and better educated voters in that group of people, they thought, well, Trump has gone way too far and we can't abide that and he's a real danger. So they wouldn't vote for him, but they still held on to this feeling that they were not being respected, that their views were not being respected. And we certainly saw that play out in Virginia, but I think there may have been some of that going on in New Jersey as well. It's just this backlash of people say, quit laughing at me. And they went to the polls and Governor Murphy is is, is going to survive, but as I said, just barely. Bill Galston, one of the articles of faith that Democrats hold is that increased voter turnout is good for Democrats. One of the lessons of Tuesday was, would you agree, that that's not necessarily so. Some of these red districts in Virginia that were going Republican by 65, 70 percent are now going Republican by 80 and 85 percent. The enthusiasm and the turnout in Republican areas far outstripped that of Democratic areas. Now, partly that is an artifact of being an off-year election and, and the party out of power and so forth. But it wasn't because anybody had passed laws limiting the franchise in Virginia. They just simply were unmotivated. Well, Mona, I guess I would point out that This untruth seems to be the common property of both political parties, because just as Democrats have long believed that increased turnout benefits them, Republicans appear to believe that decreased turnout benefits them. How else to explain Mm -hmm. what's been going on in recent months? And so it's, I think, quite rare when both political parties agree on a proposition that is demonstrably false. And that's the situation we're now in. If you compare the 2021 
gubernatorial election in Virginia to the previous one in 2017. I haven't checked these figures, but I just read them in an analysis. Uh, McAuliffe actually bettered Northam's total by 200,000 votes, which mm -hmm. is great. But Youngkin increased the Republican vote over 2017 by 500,000. I think if Republicans take on board the fact that voter enthusiasm can go in their direction as well as the opposite direction, maybe we can find a point of equipoise on the laws of voting in the various states. Damon Linker, are you as tired as I am of hearing about the fleece vest? <laughs> Like every single story about Yunkin is like, and then along came Glenn Yunkin with his fleece vest and reassured everybody that he was not Trump. It was all apparently about the damn mm. vest. <laughs> well, by the way, I'm surprised the Democrats didn't come up with a catchy slogan like "Don't get fleeced." Uh, <laughs> they need That's you, what, Bill. Yeah, the Bill Bill should, has political consulting is your next <laughs> career change. Yeah. Um, I, it didn't particularly bother me, but that's because I don't live in Washington, so I haven't been bombarded with this quite as much, I think, as those of you who do live in the D.C. area. And I think the Virginia results were, especially the governor's race, was easily the least important and interesting result. I mean, I think it was Bill who pointed out on this podcast a month or so ago in looking forward to this election that kind of just thermostatically, this is a very consistent election. The governor's race in Virginia comes one year after a presidential election and every recent year other than 2013, the party that does not hold the White House wins. Mm -hmm. And that happened this time. So in other words, I looked at one way, this election was exactly what you would have predicted. And it was pretty close, too. It was like two points two separating points. them. So it wasn't a huge sweep. However, let me go very briefly through a series of more troubling results for Democrats. Secondly, so in Virginia, three statewide offices that were on the ballot, all won by Republicans. The Republicans also took control of the House of Delegates, only, I believe, by, I think, two seats, but still winning is winning. Then in New Jersey, yes, it is true that Phil Murphy had to fight far, far harder than he or just about any pollster was predicting he would. But far more remarkable is the fact that a no-name truck driver named Edward Durr ended up barely, but he did beat Steve Sweeney, who was the Senate president in New Jersey, overturned him. He had been in office, I think, for a record number of years, about two decades. And so that is truly shocking. I mean, his campaign was very funny. It literally spent a grand total of $153, not $153,000, <laughs> $153, <laughs> Dollars and about half of that was on Dunkin' Donuts for his shoestring. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that, there, there, there's a Republican winning where you would not have expected it. And if you dig down into the numbers, you can see the swing away from the Democrats was very large in New Jersey. Now, by the same token, again, maybe New Jersey, not that big of a deal. They had a Republican governor as recently as the beginning of 2018. So, again, maybe this is just sort of normal. But then we turn to other elections, like in Seattle, the city attorney's office, a Republican won by running against abolitionism of police. Uh, the Democratic... And Seattle, let us note, is not known as a conservative stronghold. No, absolutely <laughs> not. And the Democratic mayor who won, won uh, over a candidate who had cut uh, spending on the police, and she was in favor of increasing spending on police. In Minneapolis, there was a vote against abolishing the police department. So those last two, especially, I think, 
really show that this was, despite the kind of natural swings of two parties, which in and of itself is kind of remarkable given the Trumpian factors of our recent politics. You wouldn't necessarily think that it would just swing back to the Republicans. You know, uh, some people, some even affiliated with the bulwark have been pushing a, a position that actually one should not vote for any Republican because they are still within the grip of Donald Trump. And yet we did have a swing back toward Republicans, and it was pretty broad across the country, even in the in places like Seattle, where kind of lines were drawn over issues about policing and related issues. So if I were a Democrat, I would be uh, very nervous about what's going to happen a year from now, even beyond, once again, the kind of thermostatic norms of the first midterm election and a new presidency going to the other party. Things aren't lining up in a way that are distressing. And I'll have more to say about that, I think, probably the next time it comes around to me. I'll shut up for now. <laughs> okay. Jonathan Ruth, I'm going to just add one more little datum to Damon's excellent list. And that is that, I, I don't think you mentioned this, Damon, that in the Buffalo mayor's race, the Democratic incumbent was unseated in the primary by a Democratic socialist named India Walton. So she had the Democratic nomination and she was unopposed by any Republican. And yet the existing mayor, Byron Brown, who uh, she had defeated in the primary, decided to run as a write-in candidate and he beat her as a write-in candidate by something like 20 points. I don't know the exact numbers. And the New York City mayoralty is firmly in the hands of a Democrat who was very much not in the defund the police mold. And so the question for you, Jonathan, is do you have any doubt about the mood of the electorate here and what they're trying to convey? Uh, it was a bad, bad election for Democrats. There's no point trying to gild that lily. I think, though, my take may be a, a bit unusual in that I thought this was a very constructive election because I thought it delivered corrective messages to both parties that both would be wise to heed. On the Republican side, the message is you can do very well. In fact, you can do better by separating yourself from Trump and the excesses of his looniness. I wish Governor-elect Youngkin had separated himself more than he did. But he clearly wasn't running as a stop the steal radical. He clearly rejected the Fox News, the Tucker Carlson conspiracy narratives and all of that. And I think that set a path for Republicans if they can take it. Now, that's, that's a big if. I can tell you about Arizona, where I just got back from, where the Republican Party is going the opposite direction. And then I thought Democrats got a corrective message also. One, get your act together on Capitol Hill, cut out the, the childishness. Second, more important, I don't know how the voters could be any more clear that they are not on board with the radical wing of the party, the progressive woke wing of the party. They shoot it down at every turn. I wasn't surprised that Terry McAuliffe lost. I thought he was running a messageless campaign. He clearly was losing on momentum and message toward the end. And he couldn't really answer the criticisms from the right about what wokeness is doing or maybe trying to do in schools. So I thought there was a clear message to the Democrats as well about needing to move back to the center, get message oriented, get away from just bashing Trump. So uh, this, I think there's a lot of potential for good here if the parties can digest the lessons that this election, I think, is trying to teach. We're going to turn now to a discussion about whether those lessons will indeed be learned. But before we do, I just want to add a personal addendum about Youngkin. I am someone who voted for Republican candidates for something like 40 years and just stopped in 2016. I did not vote for Glenn Youngkin, though he was the sort of candidate I would have been happy to vote for, but for the Trump influence. And I would just say this, yes, he threaded the needle, but... He didn't have the strength of character to really go all the way and say, yes, the election was free and fair in 2020, which is the most important question, I think, for any decent politician to respond to. He didn't do that until he was safely the nominee. Furthermore, he had as his surrogate in all the Trumpier parts of the state, Amanda Chase, who has described herself as Trump in heels and who is completely bought into all the conspiracy theories. 
And I think who even recommended that the president declare martial law after the election and confiscate voting machines. So the fact is that he was perfectly happy to ally himself with that during the campaign to win. And for me, that was just a bridge too far. And if in 2024, we are in a situation where Trump is on the ballot, there's a disputed election, and the Virginia slate of delegates, Virginia voters have chosen to vote for the Democrat, and Youngkin is under pressure from the Republican Party to submit an alternate slate of delegates, do I think he'd have the strength of character to resist that? I don't have great confidence because of what I've seen so far. All right. Let us now move to the interpretations. So here's Ron Brownstein. He says, all politics are presidential, meaning that because Biden was so unpopular, it radiated down. These races were not really run on local issues. I'm not sure that's right, Linda, or at least it may be partially right. Certainly politics has become nationalized to some extent, but Don't you think that's not completely right? I mean, living in Virginia, I certainly felt that the schools issue was particularly salient. The polls suggest that it was. McAuliffe stepped on a rake by saying parents shouldn't be involved in what schools teach. He campaigned at the end with Randy Weingarten, who has to be the least popular person (laughs) in the state at the moment. I mean, the schools were closed for something like 18 months. And then for a while, the teachers were saying they weren't going to get vaccinated and all kinds of things that really alienated parents. I think that's right. But let me just defend a little bit of Ron's comment that all politics are presidential. I think the way in which that is true for this election, and indeed for all of the elections that took place across the country, was that for a large swath of voters, independents and some Republicans like you and me and others, Donald Trump just destroyed the Republican Party, and we found ourselves not just holding our nose or or not voting in the election, but actually voting for Joe Biden with some enthusiasm, because I think we thought he was going to be competent and that politics was going to be different and that he was a moderate and that it was going to be the moderate voice within the Democratic Party that was going to take center stage on the national stage. Unfortunately, I don't think that's happened. And I've said this on the podcast before, I think what's happened is that Biden, at least in his rhetoric and in some of his appointments and some of the way he talks about issues, has moved much more towards the progressives. And in doing so, he has disappointed a lot of us. And I think those suburban voters, independents and others in Virginia, that did influence the way they viewed this election. Certainly, It isn't just election in counties like Loudoun County, where I lived for a dozen years, that this is an issue. It is the way education nationally is also playing out. I mean, we do have all of this uh, progressive move in terms of, of the Biden administration. They've put in charge of the Office for Civil Rights in the Education Department, the woman who basically wanted to make sure that people accused of sexual harassment or sexual assault uh, didn't have normal due process and who sent out a dear colleague letter telling colleges that they should not be giving those kinds of rights to the accused. In terms of the way the president himself talks about issues, the transgender issue, which whether you like it or not, is an issue that divides Americans and most Americans are not comfortable with the concept that gender is simply fluid and that we all decide for ourselves what gender we are. You know, going back to the Jonathan Rauch discussion, biology matters. And there is such a thing as biological truth. And we're now sort of being badgered on that subject. All of those things have not been helped by the way Joe Biden has talked about them, even on critical race theory. I mean, everybody says, well, critical race theory isn't really taught in high school. No, it's not taught as a subject. But the underpinnings of critical race theory, that in fact, the United States is a deeply racist society, that systemic racism infects all of our institutions, that our constitution itself was predicated on slavery and was meant to promote slavery. 
all of those ideas have worked their way into public school curriculum around the country. I don't have kids in the schools in Virginia, so I don't know if they're there. I do know because I've had grandkids in the schools in Montgomery County that some of those ideas are there. And this has been, I think, what has caused this reaction. And it is not going well for the Democrats. I think they have to wise up and realize that the progressive wing of the Democratic Party does not speak for the majority of Americans on some of these important issues. Damon, there's of course been, there's been a lot of demagoguery on both sides of this. There there are certainly some Republicans who are playing to racial animosities and fears. And there are certain Democrats who are also demagoguing this by saying that anybody who wants, uh, who opposes what is called CRT, and that term is very loose, but simply don't want to be taught about the history of slavery and discrimination in this country. And uh, by the way, polls show that something like 73% of respondents in one poll that I saw absolutely believe in teaching slavery and discrimination as part of American history. But the same poll found that only 48% thought that CRT should be taught. So at least there's some hesitation about what the content is. And and I'm just going to give you one example of something that was used in a workshop for teachers in New York City under the de Blasio administration. And it it was an effort to help them understand white supremacy culture. And among the things that were considered emblems of white supremacy culture were perfectionism, individualism, either or thinking, and so on. And, you know, to be told that perfectionism or, or individualism are artifacts of white supremacy would strike a lot of people as A, not true, and be incredibly unjust to minorities who are often very perfectionist and do very well with that trait. Yeah. I, I, anytime uh, I hear a story about well, things like that being taught in school, I mean, my eyes roll out of my head because, <laughs> I mean, it's a version of what I forget who it was on the podcast last week quoted uh, uh, the line from professor somewhere relating to the latest cancellation story that you know, uh, actually having rigorous standards of debate and argument are a product of white culture. I got culture. it right here. Yeah, exactly. As From, a Williams College professor, this yeah. idea of intellectual debate and rigor as the pinnacle of intellectualism comes from a world in which white men dominated. Right, exactly. So, uh, I mean, it, it's, it reminds me of Nietzsche talking about the revaluation of, of all values. So you kind of if if the the faction of of the country that you are uh, very attached to isn't doing as well as you'd like on test scores or something, then you just simply invert the hierarchy and say, actually, doing bad on test scores is better than doing well on test scores. Or you, mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's not a, it's not the right way to go about it. And I, I actually would would like to slightly change the vocabulary because I, I understand why the the term CRT or critical race theory has, has gotten a lot of traction uh, in our debates. You know, these are complicated issues and we, we need little slogans to kind of stand in for what we mean. But here's a slight tweak to that. How about the old-fashioned concept of the colorblind society? Nate Cohn, who's the kind of the data cruncher at the New York Times, had a very good Twitter thread Wednesday night in which he talked about this a little bit, that if you listen to Yunkin's speeches about this, you know, he's gotten a lot of attention. Now he's, he, all he did was harp on critical race theory all the time. And Dem- a lot of Democrats, especially progressives, just dismiss this. It's all fake. It's not real. It doesn't exist. And, uh, you know, the fact is, uh, Nate Cohn quotes in this tweet thread, uh, part of Yunkin's stump speech, where he talks about race. And what is it that he talks about? About how... America is a great country, the best country on the world. That's the best country in the world, standard kind of a politician boilerplate. But but then he says, and of course, we've we've fallen short. We've we've done bad things. We we've uh, failed in, in certain ways. And we need to teach our kids about all of that, the great as well as the lapses and the injustices. But what we want, what we need to keep teaching them is what Martin Luther King wanted, is a country where these 
these differences, our racial distinctions don't really matter. And Nate Kahn points out that this is the rhetoric that Barack Obama used while running for president in 2008. And right. what what the Democrats have have effectively done by grabbing on to what is called CRT is is a kind of inversion of that ideal. And if you read like some of the more popular books, not only D'Angelo and Kendi, but Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, a very mm-hmm. influential book on the left and among college students. God, I just taught at a couple of colleges over the last few years, and, and that book is ubiquitous on campus. A major thrust of its argument is that we have to get rid of the ideal of the colorblind society. What Democrats, by wrapping themselves in that mantle, I fear are doing is they are seeding the more universalistic aspirations of the colorblind society to Republicans and allowing the party that nominated and elected Donald Trump just yesterday (laughs) to to have the, the successful Virginia governor's candidate to win by portraying himself and his party as the champions of the colorblind society. That's, I think, it's it's not only morally offensive to me that Democrats are letting go of that ideal for themselves in favor of something else that's more pernicious. But politically, it's really, really dumb. And if they continue to do it, I fear they're going to reap the whirlwind because I don't think there is anywhere close to a majority of Americans who really want to let go of that ideal. And well, they shouldn't. Yeah. Bill Galston, there's another thing that happens in addition to uh, when when the left embraces, uh, well, rejects the idea of a colorblind society, and then they get pushback. Their reaction, and this was evident on MSNBC on election night and and on left wing Twitter since, is they sort of, in my opinion, all too readily lapse into calling the the voters racists and. You know, look, some voters are racist, but a lot of them aren't. A lot of the people who voted in Virginia for Obama twice and voted for Biden have also voted for Young, and they didn't suddenly do so because they they were racist. And I, I just I just think that's such a dead end and so dangerous. And also, one more thought. Uh, I guess I've said this before, but but I think it's worth repeating. I want the Democrats to get their act together. I want them to be successful because I think the Republican Party is not fit to govern right now. And seeing the Democrats just lapse into their own little silo here and and convince themselves that when people vote against them, it's because they're all racist, I get really worried. Well, the question on the table right now, Mona, is whether either party is fit to govern. Yeah. Uh, but well let said. Me, uh, let me uh, let me comment on what you just said, and then go on to push back a little bit against the thrust of the panel so far. Okay. First of all, Terry McAuliffe's response to the critical race theory controversy was twofold. First of all, to deny that critical race theory was taught in Virginia schools, which is true, but beside the point for the reasons that Linda, I believe, stated very well. Secondly, he referred to that aspect of the Youngkin campaign as, quote, a racist dog whistle. Mm -hmm. Uh, I should point out that the whole point of a dog whistle is that only dogs can hear the whistle. Mm -hmm. Uh, And therefore, you know, by calling it a racist uh, dog whistle, he was saying that the people who heard it were racists. Uh, I don't think you make a lot of progress as a political candidate by accusing the people who are turning against you of being racists and that that is the principal reason why they're turning against you, not how to make friends and influence people among persuadable voters. Having said that, let me go on to make a somewhat critical point about the center of gravity of this conversation so far. I suspect that most listeners to this podcast up to this point would assume that schools were the top issue in the Virginia gubernatorial race. 
which is not true. The economy was the top issue by a considerable margin. And if you add to that the fact that inflation has risen to the top of the American people's concerns about the economy, you will be led to understand better one of the great background features of all the elections in the country a couple of nights ago. And that is that inflation is an unbelievably potent issue. You have to be as old as I am to remember the great inflation of the 1970s and what it did to American politics. Not quite. Uh, I remember it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was wondering how many, you know, how many people on this show would admit to that memory. Okay. So, you know, you know, so that's, you know, I really think that just because Republicans seem to want to make it all about culture doesn't mean that it's all about culture. As the old song goes, the fundamental truths apply as time goes by. And the default setting in American politics is that if there are economic problems, they tend to predominate. And I'm not gainsaying the impact, the impact of culture. Finally, I want to underscore a point that Mona made and draw out a moral. At the beginning of this week, uh, Brookings and the Public Religion Research Center, Research Institute, who have been doing something called the American Values Survey for the past 12 years, released its latest report. I've written about it. It is an extraordinary piece of work, and I'm not saying that because I was involved in it. Here's one of the questions. We should teach American history to our children in public schools that option A includes both our best achievements and our worst mistakes as a country. Option B focuses on what makes this country exceptional and great. 90% of Democrats opted for option A, best achievements and our worst mistakes. 86% of independents did the same thing. Now you're waiting for the punchline. You think I'm going to tell you that only 40% of Republicans went for option A. In fact, 80% of them did. There is an underlying consensus in this country on how American history should be taught in public schools. And it drives me crazy that we can't get to what 85% of the American people want. Why not? This is, you know, this is why American, the American people are beginning to wonder whether either party is capable of governing and why our politics has gone nuts. Right. So, um, Jonathan Rauch, the, par, look, uh, part of it is that places where Democrats are in charge, as in the San Francisco public schools, which were closed for a very long time, arguably longer than they needed to be, but whatever, that was a judgment call. But while the schools were closed, they were busy renaming them and eliminating schools uh, named after Washington, Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln. They even removed the name of a school that was named after Senator Dianne Feinstein. Um, they later backtracked on some of this after getting <laughs> after getting pushback. But uh, but you know it's not it's not some mystery why people think that when Democrats are in charge that they go too far with this kind of thing. Is it? Well. <laughs> One hates to overgeneralize and play into the hands of the Fox News crowd who, right, are, I know. who are so energetically and effectively taking every incident of nuttiness on the left and treating it as emblematic of the entire Democratic Party. We, we do need to remember that the nominee and victor in 2020 was not any of those people on the far left. It was Joe Biden. And the reason, as I said earlier, I see opportunity in the message that the voters are sending is if it reminds Biden of uh, who he needs to be. And, and yeah, Jonathan, he... can I, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but can you just drill down on that a little bit? I mean, don't you think this is a moment for Joe Biden to reassert, you know, he used to say back when he first won the presidency, he used to remind people that 
he won. Bernie Sanders did not win. That the the party chose him, and he did so with a certain amount of pride. He seems to have lost that. He uh, uh, to to quote my uh, my friend Mike Murphy, what you know when he travels up to Capitol Hill supposedly to crack the whip and tell his caucus, look, you've got to support me. Here's how it's going to be. Instead, he slips on a Mao cap and goes with the progressives. Sorry for that. I thought that was funny. But anyway, d- don't you think that this is it we're past it but that is there still an opportunity for joe biden to assert that he is the leader of the party and that what the voters wanted as abigail spanberger said was this is abigail spanberger congresswoman from a swing district in virginia she said nobody elected him to be fdr they elected him to be normal and stop the chaos well of course the first question is does biden want to do what clinton did after 1994 and pivot right. to the center. Um, right. I, God, suspect, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, also I suspect that if he wasn't inclined to last Monday, that he's more inclined to now. As I said, I don't see how the voters could have sent clearer messages. Where culture is an issue, Bill's right. It's not the only issue, certainly the pandemic, certainly the economy. Yeah. Uh, but we know that the Republicans are going hard on culture and we know it's working for them. So I'm hoping that Biden understands that, but it's not really up to just him. The notion that he could go up Capitol Hill, crack a whip and make Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema and maybe a few others who are lurking in the shadows behind those two, uh, that he could crack their whip and make them do his bidding is nonsense. So I think what we have to hope for is that the party starts to get the message here and start to realize if they can't govern, Um, And if they can't reject the most extreme voices in their own side and understand the political toxicity of that, they're in deep trouble. And if, you know, maybe Tuesday's wipeout in Virginia and extraordinary results in all these other places, maybe that will be the teaching moment they need. If it's not, I can't imagine what would be. Right. Um, I, I will just close this segment by quoting the great James Carville. Uh, I wish I could do his accent. I'm afraid I cannot. No but uh, <laughs> no one else speaks like James. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, but he said, "What went wrong is just stupid wokeness. Don't just look at Virginia and New Jersey. Look at Long Island. Look at Buffalo. Look at Minneapolis. Even look at Seattle, Washington. I mean, this defund the police lunacy. This take Abraham Lincoln's name off schools. I mean, people can see that. And then he says, some of these people need to go to a woke detox center or something. <laughs> I fell out of my seat when I heard him say that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I really I wish we could make James Carville, uh, you know, sort of the I don't know the the, the guru of the Democratic Party because he's very solid. Okay, um, we were going to get to uh, the role of Trump in all of this. That will have to wait for next week or some other time. And we have now come to the part of our program we call highlights and lowlights of the week. <laughs> And I will start with you, Jonathan Rauch. Well, of course, I'm completely unprepared for this question, but fortunately, I have an answer. Now, this is this is a personal highlight. Okay. It's not something that was in all the papers, but I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm I got back from um, over a week in my home turf of, of Arizona, Phoenix, where I was born and raised, and where there is a real battle going on of uh, over the future of the Republican Party and where right now the extremists are winning. It's pretty extraordinary what's happened out there because Arizona Republicans have decided to do the opposite of what Virginia Republicans have done and what just works so well in Virginia. They appointed a state party chair who is all Trump all the time, conspiratorial minded. They fomented a completely partisan so-called audit of the election results. Their gubernatorial candidate is a former Fox News host with no experience in governing, who smashes TVs running on demolishing the mainstream media um, and promising basically that if there's another election that the Democrats win, they will have stolen it. She is the likely nominee and she is probably likely to lose to a Democrat, which is hard to do for a Republican gubernatorial candidate in Arizona. So we're seeing a real test out there, but I spent time with a a gentleman by the name of Stephen Richard, the Maricopa County Recorder. 
He is the official in charge of registering the voters and counting the vote for the fourth largest county in the United States, uh, and it's a swing county. And it went narrowly, but importantly for Biden in 2020, which was the time that, that Richard got elected. And I got inspired by the fact that instead of being silenced and intimidated by the direction that his party is going, he's a Republican, he is pushing back and pushing back hard. He has launched a political action committee to support Republicans who will speak out against Stop the Steal and affirm the validity of the 2020 election. He understands that what the, the MAGA crowd is doing is trying to drive honest people, honest Republicans out of politics by using intimidation, not just the political kind, but the physical kind. Physical threats will kill you and your family. And he is not having it. He is outspoken. He is pushing back. He is organizing. He says he's in touch with other Republicans nationally who are doing the same. And that's, if anything can turn this around, it's going to be that kind of fighting spirit among liberal-minded, small liberal-minded Republicans. So I was inspired by spending time with him. Thanks for that, uh, and God bless the man. Really, I, I've heard him. Uh, I've heard him speak, and uh, and I couldn't agree more. Okay, uh, let us now turn to Linda Chavez. Well, you know, I'm always obsessed with immigration, um, mm -hmm. and today there is an absolutely stunning um, compilation of data on the immigration issue in Tom Edsel's column in the New York Times. It's called. The third rail of American politics is still electrifying. And it really was, um, I guess it was a low light for me because, you know, I've been looking at all the polling data that shows the latest Gallup poll shows 75% of Americans now think immigration is a good thing for America. The number who think it's a bad thing has fallen to 21%. That's a, a big shift over the last 20 years. And obviously, given Trump and Trump's influence, it's, it's really heartening to hear that Americans are not anti-immigrant. Well, after reading Tom Edsel's column, I'm not nearly as optimistic because what he does is he goes through and drills down on the immigration issue and how it affects American politics. And as one who has been highly critical of Joe Biden and highly critical of the Democrats for not doing more to try to get immigration reform passed, uh, looking at this data, it concerns me because what it shows is that Immigration may not be the top voting issue for most Americans. It rarely is, not even for Hispanic uh, voters, but it is a very salient issue for those right-wing uh, restrictionists who have dominated American immigration policy over the last 30 years. And so I commend Tom Etzel's column. I think it's got a lot of data that those of us who are on the side of trying to get something done on immigration, I would still argue that maybe even because of these uh, this polling data, that if it's ever going to be done, it's got to be done now. And it's it's got to be done while the Democrats still hold uh, control of uh, the two houses of Congress. But anyway, it's a great article. I commend it to our listeners. Thank you very much. Okay, Bill Galston. Well, I have a lot to say about immigration policy, but this is not the right time to say it. But I do think we ought to come back to, to this issue in a future uh, podcast. Indeed. Uh, sadly, you know, my choice for this week is a low light. As of a couple of days ago, the death toll from COVID-19 in the United States stands at more than three quarters of a million people. I remember back at the beginning of the pandemic when an Oxford analysis based on a model showed that pandemic deaths in the United States could approach or even top one million. You know, it was derided as academics going nuts. Well, if things continue as they're now going, it's going to be dead on, so to speak. A and no other advanced democracy has a rate of infection and deaths over the past 18 months that comes anywhere close to the United States. This is a system failure. And we ought to think very hard about how we have attained our status, you know, as the worst responder to COVID in the advanced democratic world with all of our advantages. 
This is deeply troubling to me. Might be a citizen failure uh, as much as a system failure. Yeah, but the citizens are part of the system. They are. Whether admit it or not. Yep. All right. Thank you. Uh, Damon Linker. Uh, well, I, I'm going to stick with electoral politics since it was a big election week. My highlight is a, a very nice, fairly uh, short piece by the pollster and election analyst Sean Trend at uh, Real Clear trendy. Politics. Trendy. Yes. <laughs> He's very trendy at, uh, yes. at Real Clear Politics. Uh, did a nice piece titled Three Takeaways from the Election in uh, Virginia and New Jersey. And uh, he his analysis tracks pretty closely with what I said in my opening segment on this podcast, that Virginia wasn't great for the Democrats, though not that surprising, and that uh, New Jersey was worse and more worth digging down into. And he does do a little bit of digging. And the thing that he ends up fastening on is a, a close look at what happened in Passaic County in northern New Jersey. And what he finds there is that even without a Trump on the on the ballot, the recent trends, not trendy, the recent trend in, uh, in electoral politics where working class voters move away from the Democrats and toward the Republicans, this continued. But also that the areas within Passaic County that swung most heavily in the GOP direction were the most heavily Hispanic areas of the county which shows that one of the most, for Democrats, alarming outcomes from the 2020 election, namely a swing, a substantial swing among Hispanic voters in the direction of the Republicans, is continuing even into the 2021 a kind of off-cycle election. And again, without Trump on the ballot, because some, some analysts have wondered, well, is this just because there was something kind of distinctly macho about Trump that appealed? to Hispanic voters or something like this. This shows that actually it's a broader based thing than that. Whether it's running from the Democrats or running toward the Republicans, something is afoot. And it is yet another thing that Democrats really have to be looking at and trying to address uh, as as well as they can and as quickly as possible. Yeah, uh, we will obviously continue to discuss all of these things on Beg to Differ. I think uh, it would be good to hear from David Shore on this. And of course, Linda follows it closely. Uh, you know, if the Democratic Party cannot rely on lopsided percentages of the Hispanic vote, they're not going to win any more elections because the uh, loyalty of the African American community is just not enough to get them over the top in any place except for a few very, very blue districts. All right. So that will, uh, that will be a subject for, for more discussion. I will close with a reflection on who endorses who. So the bulwark in concert with others and was statement was jointly published by the bulwark and the new Republic called an open letter in defense of democracy. And it was signed by a number of people, including a number who are regulars on this podcast. And it talked about the importance of standing up for liberal democracy, and it was harsh about Republican attacks on the integrity of our elections. And it said things like, quote, unfazed by the January 6th insurrection, Trump and his supporters actively work to exploit anxieties and prejudices to promote reckless hostility to the truth and to Americans who disagree with them and to discredit the very practice of free and fair elections in which winners and losers respect the peaceful transfer of power, unquote. So first, I would just like to note that Terry McAuliffe, though he has had his moments of election denialism uh, in one case regarding uh, Stacey Abrams, uh, did concede, and that was exactly the normal way we do things in this country. So two cheers for that. But I also just want to comment on the response that I received on Twitter because a number of people signed this document. And of course, all of us signed it after reading the document. We read the document, said, do you agree or disagree? Would you put your name to it? We didn't know who else was going to sign it. And one of the people who signed it turns out to have been Noam Chomsky. So my critics online said, ah, there you see, Mona Charon's really jumped the shark now. She's in league with Noam Chomsky. And so I can only say to that, 
the line that uh, it reminded me of Ronald Reagan's line when he was challenged in the 1980 campaign that the John Birch Society had endorsed him. And wasn't this discrediting to him, he said. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. They endorsed me. I didn't endorse them. Okay. (laughs) So if Noam Chomsky, who I have been exceedingly critical of my entire career, if he's willing to sign on to a statement in defense of liberal democracy, fine. It doesn't discredit the statement. And uh, so that's my full comment on that. I Mona, want to, yes. ours, ours is an age of miracles. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's true. I, I, I will say I never did expect in my lifetime to be on the same document. And you were too, right, Jonathan, uh, with, uh, <laughs> with Noam Chomsky. And, and yes, everybody was. So anyway, uh, let us, uh, I, I want can, to. Can I, can I add here that I signed yeah. the Harper's letter and he signed that too. So I have now signed two documents with Noam Chomsky. Yes. I had no idea you were such a communist, Damon. I know. I know. <laughs> no, he's a columnist. And I, not, I signed none of them. Uh, Mona, because I wasn't asked. So. Oh, Linda, you're traveling so much. Nobody can ever I find know. Nobody you. knows where I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, Jonathan Rauch, always a great honor to have you on Beg to Differ. And uh, I want to thank one and all for listening. Our numbers, ladies and gentlemen, are through the roof. I don't know why, but we are, we're really cooking with gas, as my grandmother might have said. And there are going to be a few changes coming. We, you may have noticed that we have new music. So that was the first one. And down the road, there'll be a few, a few minor tweaks that you'll be seeing. And uh, I want to thank you all for listening, to urge you to tell your friends and to rate and review us. And we will return next week as everything. Thank you.